Good afternoon and welcome to, whoop, I'm going to have to adjust the lighting a little bit. Welcome to the Rye Historical Society's Happy Hour History, History Happy Hour. And we are going to be reading um, from chapter 3, page 38, about the Rye Boundaries and then chapter 4, if we can muscle through this uh, in one fell sweep about population. I'm Debbie Tuey. I'm a board member of the Rye Historical Society and I welcome you to our reading today in my garden. I thought it'd be kind of fun for summertime. Chapter 3, Rye Boundaries. When the Sandy Beach District of Newcastle was by the provincial government con constituted the Parish of Rye, the boundary line between the new parish and the adjoining towns seems not to have been definitively settled throughout its entire extent, and this shortly caused embarrassment that called for further legislation. The new parish included not only the tract that had been known as Sandy Beach, but portions of the territory from Portsmouth and Greenland, and quite a generous piece of Hampton. The lines marking the limits of Portsmouth and Greenland appear to have been clearly defined, the provincial papers presenting no record of disputes between Rye and those towns in regard to boundaries. But in regard to the Rye and Hampton line, it was different. That at an earlier date, the line between Hampton and Sandy Beach had been settled is shown by the following extracts from the provincial records, the first one bearing the date of 20 June 1701. That Hampton bounds on the north side is to run beginning at a stake or marked tree at the northerly side, Jocelyn's Neck, which is later for more than a century known as Locks Neck and now called Straws Point, by the seaside as by agreement Doe appear, and from thence on a straight line to meet with the end of five miles due north from Hampton Meeting House, not far from the end from Winnicunnet River, and from thence westerly as formally bounded out by the committees appointed for that end, the date of the committee's return being 1652 and 1653, appointed to run the lines for the town of Newcastle, Mr. James Randall, James Leach, and William Berry. The Bounds Report of Committee on Town Lines. The bounds between the ports and Hampton or a small beech tree near Winnicunnet, Winnicut River marked H on north side, RW. 1718, JF having several trees by it that are marked with sundry letters and one 1718, this tree being called the North Tree. And this will come up later, it's an important marking the North Tree and is five miles due north from Hampton Old Meeting House. We of the committee did run it and measure it on the 16th day of September 1718 and from said tree to run towards the seaside south 67 degrees and 30 minutes east or east 22 degrees and 30 minutes south to a stake that is drove down south 50 degrees west distance and 17 rods from Joseph Locke's corner of his cellar door and on the same course to the seaside at Locke's point of the neck, Locke's neck, and from said north tree on a west point towards Stratum to the house of Abraham Morgan, these to be the settled bounds between Portsmouth and Hampton, so said by Mark Hunking, James Davis, Peter Weir, and Gillian, and others. Hi. The North Tree, described and definitively located in this report, is frequently mentioned in public documents of that period relating to the boundaries of Portsmouth, Greenland, Stratum, Rye, Newcastle, Northampton, and Hampton. But this report is the only one that I have discovered that explains what and where the North Tree was other than that it was a prominent boundary mark and a sort of general starting point for boundaries to be measured from and for boundary reports to refer to. It stood at the extreme northerly point of Hampton in an angle made by a change of course of the boundary between Hampton and Portsmouth 
and was evidently selected not on account of its size and prominence. The report says it was a small beech tree and had other trees near it, but because it was exactly five miles due north of Hampton Old Meeting House. When the North Parish of Hampton was set off in 1738, instead of Hampton Old Meeting House being taken as a starting point for the purpose of fixing its southerly boundary and measuring two miles northward from there, measurement was made from the North Tree three miles to the southward, where a boundary mark was set up and a line run from that bound mark east-southeast to the sea and north-northwest to the Hampton Line. The line that in 1718 was run east 22 degrees 30 minutes south from the North Tree to the seaside at Locks Point of the Neck, that was to be the settled bounds of Portsmouth and Hampton, did not bound Portsmouth and Hampton throughout its entire length. Newcastle was incorporated in 1693 and Sandy Beach which with Great Island comprised that town, extended along the shore to the Hampton boundary. The North Tree apparently disappeared in time as possibly did other surveyors landmark of 1718. Joseph Locke's corner of his cellar door, neither of them appearing in any of the state papers late in the 18th century. The bounds of Newcastle shall begin at Sampson's Point and run southwest until it come in sight of the house that was Anthony Libby's where it meets Hampton Line from the North Tree to the sea as it settled by this committee. And from the place where it meets Hampton Line above said to run east to the sea to the great pond to a maple at the side of the pond that is marked and then over the pond to the beach to a great round stone to the eastward of Ragged Neck. These lines being according to their charter, the this east line from Hampton Line by Anthony Libby's house above said to the bounds between Newcastle and Portsmouth and the above said southwest line also as it was run by the committee seven by the 17th, oh, seven. So that'd be July the 17th, 1718. Bounds North Parish of Hampton. Excuse me while I take a sip. And I suggest that you have a sip also. <clears throat> Bounds North Parish of Hampton. In Council May 2nd, 1718, ordered that there be a parish in the north part of Hampton. In Council May 29th, 1719, the committee appointed to ascertain the bounds of the new parish at the north end of Hampton made their return as follows. I'm not sure what PRO stands for, but PRO of Nor N, Hampshire. We, the subscribers, being a committee appointed by the governor and counselor for to settle and ascertain the bounds and limits of a parish granted by the governor and council of May 2nd, 1719, within the township of Hampton at the north end of said town. It shall take its beginning at the north tree betwixt Hampton and Portsmouth and to measure three miles south from the said north tree and there to make a bound mark from thence east southeast two degrees east down to the sea and from said bound mark three miles to the south of said north tree aforesaid west northwest two degrees west as far till they meet Hampton line which runs betwixt said north tree and stratum line and the above boundaries when so run out as above specified is the bounds of said parish by us the 26th day of May 1719 and that is Nish Gilman um, John, Joan, John Gilman Mark Hunking Shattuck Walton Rich Walden secretary the perplexities and inconveniences caused by the lack of a well-defined boundary between Hampton and Rye were briefly stated in the following petition, which was dated 12 May, 1729, and signed by Richard Goss, John Knowles, and John Garland, selectman of Rye. <clears throat> 
to His Excellency William Burnett, Esquire, Captain General, and Governor in Chief in and over His Majesty's Province of New Hampshire in New England, and to the Honorable Council and the Honorable House of Representatives in General Assembly now sitting, the humble petition of the Parish of Rye in Newcastle in the Province of New Hampshire humbly saith that whereas this parish was established by a special act of General Assembly April 30th, 1726, and near one half of the freeholders and other inhabitants of the same being pulled off to said parish from other towns, a considerable number of which did before belong to Hampton Town, and having no line fixed and settled between said parish and Hampton, the said parish are under ill con conveniences respecting their parish affairs, some moving out and leaving the burden of taxes heavier upon the remnant left, and some others moving in among us and settling in that part of the parish that did belong to Hampton, which we are not empowered to levy taxes upon, nor to oblige to attend military exercises, nor to help in repairing His Majesty's highways to this parish, nor to assist in managing our other parish affairs. We laboring under these and many other ill conveniences, humbly prayeth Your Excellency and the Honorable Council and the Honorable House of Representatives to make choice of a committee of indifferent men to fix and settle a line between us and Hampton Town. Concerning this petition, the lower house of the General Assembly took action as follows, which was concurred in by the Council in the House of Representatives. Voted that the prayer of the within petition be so far granted, yet a committee of indifferent persons be chosen and go upon the spot, and that a plot be made and brought into the assembly by said committee, there are a lot of abbrevi abbreviations here, which is why I hesitate sometimes, said being S with a, upper, with a D, but I'm guessing and I think I'm correct. Uh, said committee of the old parish of Hampton with a division of the North Hill part, also of the whole parish of Rye, and also of that being that belongs to Portsmouth and Greenland, that is, Powelled off to Rye, and make their return to the General Assembly next session for further consideration, and that the petitioners pay the charges. I believe that would be October the 13th, 1729, James Jeffrey, something about the Assembly. I don't know what CLR would be, Clearer Assembly, Assemblyman. Uh, Captain jo Joshua Wingate and Mr. John Sanborn, enter, they entered their dissent against the above vote. October the 16th, 1729, in the House of Representatives, voted that Mr. Speaker Wiggins and Major Paul Gerish, Gerish Mr. Bartholomew Thing, and Nicholas Gilman and Lieutenant William Moore of Stratum or any three of them be a committee for the ends above mentioned, to make draught, and that the old parish of Hampton and that part of Hampton called North Hill be also notified of the time of running the lines and that the return be made to the General Assembly the third day of the sitting of the next sessions of the Assemblyman and all parties then to appear to make their objections, if any they have why such return may not be recommended. James Jeffrey, Assemblyman. <clears throat> Back to the author. At the same time, the session house passed the following. Whereas Benjamin Lamprey, Christopher Palmer, and Stephen Batchelder, three men that there is some dispute about between Hampton Town and the town of Rye, where they shall be raided, for ending said dispute voted, that the said three men be raided, raided at Rye. But apparently this did not suffice for the ending of said dispute. For in November 1730, the House, on petition of Stephen Batchelder, 
voted that the said Stephen Batchelder be hereby dismissed from paying to the parish of Rye any rates or taxes. At the first session of the General Assembly in 1730, the Boundary Committee reported, presenting with their report, and as a part of it, a plan for the proposed of the proposed boundary line on which the assembly took action, which was approved by the governor as follows. Provisions, oh, that's PRO is provisions. Provisions of New Hampshire. Hampton, March ye 16th, 1729 and 30th, through the year 30th, 30. We the subscribers being appointed by the government of said province a committee to draw a plan of the old parish of Hampton and the North Hill Parish, also of the whole parish of Rye, with those parsons told off from Portsmouth and Greenland. We, considering the exceeding difficulty of measuring all the aforesaid parishes by reason of the wet traveling and shortness of the time allowed us, we have returned this within plan drawn by the best information we could possibly procure. Signed by Andrew Wigan, William Moore, Nicole Gilman, Barth Thing. In Hampton Old Parish is nine square mile and one quarter. In that part set to North Hill is between square, is 13 square mile. In the parish of Rye, W-R-I, which it's written this way quite a bit going forward. In the parish of Rye is five square mile lacking 84 acres. In the Gore is 500 acres and in the Peace near Breakfast Hill is 300 acres, which being added to Rye makes the Paris, Paris, not parish, of Rye to be six square miles and 76 acres. And there's a map that's drawn out showing that, which I'm not sure how well you'll see. It's on page 43, and I will show that to you right now, should you want to look that up some point. Plan of Hampton. The Plan of Hampton Old Town and in it the old claim of North Hill and also the parish of Rye, southerly of the town meeting house, examined and tried and nearly aging with the original plans measured from the meeting house southly to the main river at the clam banks below the Falls River mouth and it is just one mile and 60 rods agreeing exactly with the former plan and from the meeting house to the town bridge being one mile and 20 rods agreeing with 20 rods of the former plan and from the meeting house to the outer point of the Great Boar's, B-O-R-E-S, head, the Great Boar's head, the distance is almost two miles. And from the meeting house to the cedars, so-called which is three trees standing on sand hills near the river's mouth, is two miles and 60 rods. From the meeting house to Freeze House is one half of one mile and 28 rods. The breadth of the marsh, from the upper upland southerly of the Freeze to the main river at the Clam Banks is one half of one mile and 12 rods. The committee appointed to report the proper boundary between the parish of Hampton Old and Rye made their report this day as on file with which produced the following votes of General Assembly. In the House of Representatives upon the hearing the persons concerned the Rye petition for a line towards Hampton and upon hearing the parties of Rye and Hampton and their arguments both agreeing on the drought, the drought voted that there shall be added to the parish of Rye by a line beginning at David Smith's lot at Portsmouth line and to run westward as said, Smith's Lot runs the length of the 1st North Division in Hampton, taking in the Smith's Lot and run westward one quarter of a mile towards Hampton as the lots called the quarter of a mile lots run and then run down to the sea at the westerly end of the said quarter of a mile lots taking the Genes and Philbrick's land to the sea and the persons and estates within these lines to belong to Rye 
to all intents and purposes. Upon reconsidering the above vote, voted that this addition be made to the above vote. Viz that the estates of Joseph Brown, James Fuller, Joseph Marston, and Francis Locke, which lie in the first North Division in Hampton, do pay to the parish of Rye all taxes therein. The bill defining the Rye and Hampton dividing line was passed by the House September 21st, 1730, and was concurred in by the council and assented to by the governor November 28th of the same year. The tract of land transferred to Rye from Hampton comprised about 1,800 acres of good quality and very valuable on account of its location and fertility. It embraced all the land in Rye lying southerly of Locke's Neck. Following the defining of their boundary line by the General Assembly of 1730, the people of Rye seem to have laid claim to all that belonged to them to something more than that, in the opinion of the selectmen of Hampton, as appears from their statements as follows. Petition relative to bounds between Hampton and Rye. To His Excellency Jonathan Belcher, Esquire Governor and Commander-in-Chief in and over His Majesty's Province of New Hampshire, in New England, to the Honorable Council and House Representatives in General Assembly Cavid. The petition of the selectmen of Hampton and in said province in, uh, in behalf of the town most humbly showed that whereas the general court of this province in November 1730 passed the following vote, namely, this goes on quite extensively, I may edit a wee bit, showed that there shall be added to the parish of Rye by a line beginning at David Smith's lot at Portsmouth line and to run westward as said Smith's lot runs the length of the first north division in Hampton taking in the said Smith's lot and run westward one quarter of a mile as the lots called the quarter of a mile lots run towards Hampton and there to run down to the sea at the westerly end of this quarter mile lot Genis and Philbrick's land of the sea the Parsons and estate within these lines belong to Rye to all intents and purposes, and that the estates of Joseph Brown, James Fuller, John Joseph Marston, and Francis Locke do pay to the parish of Rye all taxes. Your petitioners are humble, humbly of the opinion that the parish of Rye have extended their jurisdiction beyond what was the true and genuine intent and meaning of the above recited vote, they presuming to run one quarter of a mile westly from the southwestly end of said Smith's lot without any regard to the four recited lots called the quarter of a mile lots and then run down to the sea on such a course as would take in all of the Janus's and Philbrick's land. Let it lay where it will, your petitioners are humbly of opinion that their may some doubts arise on what should be the meaning of those words in the aforementioned votes taken in the Genesis and Philbrook, land of the sea, and that there is some ambiguity in them which want an explanation, without which much ill conveniency will follow the town of Hampton, having already, as well as Rye, rated the same parsons and both demanding their rates of them by means whereof such parsons labor under great difficulties and greater are like to ensue sometime in the month of March last. Benjamin Lamprey Jr. of said Hampton was actually imprisoned by Rye Constable because he would not pay to Rye. The said Lamprey living a const considerable distance in upon Hampton, second north division southwestward of the quarter of a mile lot so called your petitioners are humbly of the opinion that he ought to be rated to Hampton in all rates and all other parsons and lands also being to the southwestward of the hmm, of the randing of the westerly ends of the foresaid quarter of a mile lots from Smith lot down to the sea 
accepting only that body of land owned by John Jenis and Joseph Philbrook on which and adjoining to where they live, which body of land your petitioners humbly conceive is what was intended by the Jenis and Philbrick's land mentioned in the four recited vote. Some of Rye carry the matter so far as to say that if the four recited Joseph Brown, James Fuller, John Marston, and Francis Locke should purchase estates or any other ways come by them in part of Hampton, that it ought to be rated to Rye, <clears throat> and that by the Jenis and Philbrick is intended all of that name and that the lands belonging to any of that name belongs to Rye, the case being thus, your petitioners earnestly pray your excellency and the honorable council and house of representatives to take this petition under consideration and explain the four recited vote and what the line is between Hampton and Rye in order that the parson, person who hath had rates unjustly taken from him may have the same restored by them that did the same and your petitioners as in duty bound shall ever pray. Signed by Henry Dearborn, Josiah Moulton, Jeremiah Marston, and Abraham Drake, selectmen of said or South said Hampton, South South Hampton. I'm going to have a sip, and you should too. This petition, having been read in the House of Representatives, August 18th, 1737, it was voted that the petition petitioners serve the selectmen of Rye with a copy of the petition to appear before the General Assembly on the third day of the sitting of the General Assembly at their next sessions to show cause, if they can, why the prayer of the petition may not be granted, <clears throat> and that Daniel Fogg and Benjamin Jr. Lamp Benjamin Lamprey Jr. be not rated by either parties till the affair be ended. At the appointed time, the hearing was held and the matter later disposed of adversely to the alleged extravagant claims of Rye, as the following shows. November the 15th, 1738, in the House of Representatives, the within petitioners and the delegates of the parish of Rye were heard by their council and the House, having considered thereof, voted that this is an explanation of the vote of the General Assembly made the 26th day of uh, September, sorry, it says 9R, so I've got to translate, so September 1730, describing a line between Hampton and Rye to begin at David Lott's, okay, so going through the line, the Lot line and the divisions, I'm just going to skip some of that. And then to begin a straight line to the westerly corner of that body of land claimed by John Jenis and Richard Jenis and Joseph Philbrook, where they now live and so bounding on the westerly side of said Jenis's and Philbrook's land to the sea. Signed by James Jeffrey, Clerk Assemblyman. When Sandy Beach was created, the par was created the parish of Rye. All the territory belonging to Newcastle lying westerly of the little harbor branch of the Piscataqua was not set off to the new parish. Certain lands and persons continuing to belong to the parent town, which probably was Newcastle. Yeah, it was Newcastle. And it was not until 1791 when the province of New Hampshire had ceased to exist and the independent state of New Hampshire had taken its place that the final transfer of Newcastle lands and taxpayers to Rye was made. <clears throat> In that year, the following petition was presented to the state legislature. Petition sundry inhabitants to be annexed to Rye. To the Honorable Senate and the Honorable House of Representatives for the State of New Hampshire, the convened at Concord, the petition of sundry inhabitants and landholders of the town of Newcastle and in said state 
humbly showeth that your petitioners by reason of their local situations, S-C-I-T-U-A-T-I-O-N-S, have long labored under great inconveniences in said town by being detached from the stated place of public town meetings and schools by a river running between them and the compact part of the town, which is many times impassable by reason of temptuous, temp temptuous weather, ice, and whatever other problems there are, that our annual town meeting is by law on the first Tuesday of March, at which season of the year the river is often obstructed with ice or wind as to render it impassable for us to attend, in consequence of which we are pre-rendering it impossible for us to attend, in consequence of which we are prevented from voting on any public business thereby losing our small influence in town affairs. And when we can attend, our numbers are so few that we stand no chance with the other part of the town whereby we are forced to pay for what they please to vote. School matter, masters in particular, without having any benefit of them, some of us living upwards of a mile from the river, which if passable, we have another mile to walk to the school which we conceive to be a great hardship as we are obliged, some of us, to put our children to schools in other towns, thereby paying double taxes for them, which is a great hardship to us in particular, who have tenants, tenants on our land. It is being a great discouragement to a tenant living in such a town we would not also beg to leave to suggest that in the year 1703, the governor and council passed an order releasing the then ferryman from his taxes yearly in consideration for his ferrying over the inhabitants living on the main on, the main, on public days gratis, <clears throat> which custom was constantly complied with till very lately when the selectmen to add another grievance to us have compelled the present occupant of the ferry to pay his tax who now refuses to let us pass the river without pay for these and many other reasons your petitioners most humbly pray your honors that we may be disannexed with our estates from the town of newcastle and annexed to the town of rye which is more convenient to us for meetings and schools and your petitioners as in duty bound will ever pray. Signed by John Blunt, Samuel Rand, Benjamin Odiorn, Jacob Schaaf Jr., Jonathan Warner, and George Frost. The foregoing petition was granted December 22, 1791, and the land of Newcastle's holdings southerly of the Little Harbor Branch became a part of Rye. On the 17th of December, 1792, in order to settle a boundary line dispute between Rye and Northampton, the legislature appointed James Hill of Newmarket, Jeremiah Batchelder of Kensington, and Josiah jo Joshua Weeks of Greenland, a committee to establish and fix the line between said parish of Northampton and the parish of Rye. The report of said committee, which is recorded in Charter Records, Volume 4, page 257, to be conclusive. At that time, as already shown, Rye was a town, and so was Northampton. As early as 1719, certain residents of the North Hill section, or North Division, of Hampton petitioned the General Assembly to be set off as a parish. This was two years before the Sandy Beach people made their first attempt to get set off from Newcastle, and the prayer of the petition was not granted. <clears throat> in 1734, a considerable portion of the North Hill District having in the meantime been annexed to the then new parish of Rye, the people of the remaining portion again petitioned to be made a parish, and urged as a reason why their prayer should be granted that since the petition of 1719 was submitted, they had built a church, but again, failure resulted. In 1738, a third attempt to be set off as a parish was made, 
and on November 7th of that, of that year, the Parish of North Hill was established by act of the General Assembly to be independent of Hampton in regard to ministerial and school taxes, but not in other manners, matters. Four years later, November 30th, 1742, the North Hill Parish of Hampton was by act of the General Assembly made the town of Northampton. This did not disturb the boundary line of Rye, the act creating North Hill Parish a town, specifying and fixing only the boundary between the new town and Hampton. The other boundaries, those between the former North Hill Parish of Hampton and Stratham, Greenland and Rye, remained undisturbed by the erection of the parish into a new town. In 1744, two years after Northampton had been made a town, Jonathan Palmer and Daniel Fogg petitioned the General Assembly as follows. The petition of us, His Majesty's subjects, inhabitants of the North Parish in Hampton within said province humbly showeth that we labor under great diffi difficulty G-I-F-E-L-I-C-T-I, -I, difficulty, our houses standing just upon the line, and our land being divided, ye one part in Rye and the other in the North Parish, in Hampton, there being no way nearer than about four miles to get to the, mounting, to the meeting house in ye North Parish, and living within about two miles of Rye Meeting House, the place where we generally go to divine worship and most convenient for sending our children to school, S-C-O-L. May it please your excellency and the honorable council and house of representatives, your petitioners humbly pray that we in our estates where we live may be set of may be set of to rye, I think it's off, to rye, and your petitioners shall ever pray and see. I'm not sure what that means. The petitioners, <clears throat> it may be observed, speak of themselves as inhabitants of the North Parish of Hampton and do not mention the town of Northampton at all. If this was intentional, the motive was obscure. Their petition was disposed of by the House of Representatives on August 23, 1744, voting that the petition be dismissed so long as the opposers to the petition shall keep an open and passable way to North Hill Meeting House. The legislative record, like the petition, failing to mention Northampton. In 1748, ye petition of Abraham Libby Thomas Marden and others of Northampton were representing, yet they labors under very great difficulties with respect to their attendance upon ye public worship of God and company, I'm guessing C, praying yet they may be pulled off to ye parish of Rye, was also denied by the General Assembly, and this apparently ended attempts in that direction. <clears throat> nor do we find any further record of boundary tinkering upon boundary tinkering upon, until 1793 when the following return was made to the legislature and settled the boundary between Northampton and Rye on the lines now existing state of new hampshire rockingham ss not rockingham county Pursuant to the act of the general court of this state appointing, appointing us a committee to run the lines between the townships of Northampton and Rye, we have preambulated said line and have ascertained the courses and distances in manner following. Uh, and I'm not going to go through that. It's basically beginning at the north counter, corner of Northampton, Greenland, and Rye. So it's running the, the degrees and the rods and the distances the land of Namaya Moulton's home place is to pay in all taxes to Northampton that he now possesses he lying upon the line between said towns also Simon Lamprey's home place is to pay in all taxes the town of Rye and the selectmen of said towns 
are to take notice and govern themselves accordingly, and all polled lands between the towns of Rye and Northampton is considered to pay all taxes to the towns on each side of said line where they lie, excepting Nehemiah Moulton's and Simon Lamprey's as before mentioned. Signed by James Hill, Jeremiah Batchelder, and Joshua Weeks, the committee. And there is a tiny little map, which is, I can't even read it when I'm looking at it in front of me, so I don't think you're gonna be able to read it, but I'm showing it to you, and it is on, sorry for the rocking, page 51. The following is the official report of the preambulation of the bounds between Rye and Northampton, October 25th, 1892. So here we are, the official report. And that's about 150 years of conversation between these boundaries. I will have you know, over 150 years. Beginning in the corner bounds between the towns of Rye and Northampton on the Greenland line at a rock in the wall at the southwesterly corner of the pasture owned by Flora B. Dow, marked RNHG, and running south 69 degrees east, 256 rods to a stone post on the east side of the highway near the house of the late Oliver Garland, marked RNH, fence south 47 degrees west, 382 rods to a stone post in the pasture of the heirs of John Pickering to the eastward of Lieutenant Simon Ward's orchard, so-called, marked, I'm not sure if it's so-called orchard, <laughs> marked RNHB, thence south 70 degrees east, 86 rods to a birch tree standing in the wall marked RNHB, thence 60 degrees south, 368 rods to a stone post in the field of Joseph G. Genis marked RNHB, thence due north, 10 and a half rods, to a stone buried in the field of Alfred G. Genis, marked B. Thence, south 41 degrees, east 170 rods to a rock in the wall at the south corner of the field belonging to the heirs of Richard Genis, marked RNHB. Thence, south 54 degrees, west three and a half rods to a stone post in E.B. Philbrick's pasture, marked RNH. Fence, south 47 degrees, east 211 rods to the sea. A stone in the wall on the west side of the highway marked R N H. And that concludes chapter three. I'm going to have a sip, and chapter four, which is population, is very, very short. So hang in there. It's like a page and a half. <clears throat> Page 53, Chapter 4, Population of the History of Rye. From the constable's rates of the town of Newcastle made in December 1688, it appears probable that at that time there were not more than 50 or 20 voters in the Sandy Beach section of the town. <clears throat> the part that later was set off to the parish of Rye, nearly all of these being named Barry, Foss, Marden, Odeorn, Brackett, Seavey, or Wallace. This would indicate a to total population of from 100 to 120. In 1721, when the first petition for the erection of Sandy Beach into a parish was presented to the General Assembly, it was stated that above 240 souls would be benefited by the granting of the petition. But this included not only the population of Sandy Beach, but a considerable number of the residents of Portsmouth and a still larger number of residents of Hampton. The first census of Rye, of which there is any record, of which there is any record was made in 1773, the result being tabulated as follows. And there are a few of these. <clears throat> Unmarried men from the age of 16 to 60 years of age, 69. 
married men from age 16 to 60, 113. Boys 16 years old and under, 190. Men 60 years old and upwards, 24. Females unmarried, 259. Females married, 132. Widows, 36. 12 male slaves and 7 female slaves, 19. Total, 842. This report, which was signed by Samuel Wallace and Joseph Jenna, selectman, shows that the population was very evenly divided between the sexes, the females numbering 391 and the males 396, omitting the slaves of both sexes. Two years later, in 1775, another census was taken and a slight increase in population was shown. The return being, the return made being, males under 16 years of age, 206, males from 16 years of age to 50, not in the army, 146. All males above 50 years of age, 47. Persons gone in the army, 15. All females, 442. Negroes and slaves for life, 14. Total, 870. The same year, an inventory of the quality, quantity of powder and the number of guns in the town was made, as appears from the following. Powder, 161 pounds, public stock, none. Guns, 170. Province of New Hampshire, Rockingham. Rye, August 31st, 1775. Then, Deacon Francis Jennis and Lieutenant Nathan Gorse appeared and made oath to the above inventory before me, Samuel Jennis, Justice of the Peace. Hmm. NB, North Branch, NB 21 of the above men are not able to bear arms by reason of old age being crippled. <laughs> CRPLED. In 1786, another census was taken by the selectmen, and the following was the report. Rye, the 2nd of June, 1786, agreeable to the within resolve, the following is a return of the inhabitants of the parish of Rye, number of white and other free citizens and company, 653, other persons not comprehended in this other description, two. Nathan Goss, hmm, Namaya Moulton, and John Webster, selectmen. From this it appears that there is a decrease in the population of the town between the time of the last previous census was taken in 1775 and the taking of this one of 215, very nearly 25 percent of the population. This notable falling off was in part due to losses during the war, but in much greater measure to the removal of a large number of families back into the country where lands were much cheaper and more easily obtained than the earlier settled towns near the seashore. The other persons not comprehended in the number of white persons and other free citizens must have been slaves, and as there were but two of these, it is apparent that there had been a great decrease in the amount of slave property held in the town. The number of slaves returned by the census takers of 1773 having been 19, and in 1775 of Negroes and Slaves for Life, implying that some of the Negroes were not slaves, the number was 14. When the next census was taken in 1799, I'm sorry, 1790, the returns showed that the population had increased again almost to the figures of 1775, the tabulation being as follows, and this is the last one of the tabulation. Number of males above 16, 226. Males under 16 years, 189. Females, 439. Other free persons, eight. Slaves, three. Total, 865. The other free persons mentioned and who were not listed as being either males or females, presumably were free Negroes, 
former slaves who had been released from bondage. They probably counted for very little, certainly for nothing at all so far as having a voice in the management of parish and town affairs as was concerned. Their only use in the census was to swell the number of the population. In the year 1800, the census returns gave the town a population of 1,000. In 1835, an estimate of the number of inhabitants was made 1,200, being the number named. Since that time, the number of residents has not varied greatly. By the census of 1890, it was 978, and by the census of 1900, it was 1,142. In 1853, there were 50 widows in the town. In 1886, in a resident population of 1, 000, about 1,000 inhabitants, there were 54 widows whose united ages, I thought this was interesting, whose united ages were about 3,700 years, two being over 90 years of age, 10 of them being 80 to 90, 20 being between 70 and 80 years of age, 10 of them being between 60 and 70, four of them being between 50 and 60, six between the ages of 40 and 50, and two between the ages of 30 and 40. In the same year, there were only 29 widowers in town, four of whom were 80 years old or more, six between 70 and 80 years of age, nine between 60 and 70 years of age, six between 50 and 60 years of age, and three between 40 and 50 years of age, and one less than 40. And that concludes chapter four of the history of Rye. And this concludes the reading of the history of Rye written by L.B. Parsons uh, in 1903. And this is, it's been a, a lot of fun starting in COVID, we're still in COVID, reading this history and bringing something virtually to you since our museum was closed during all of that time. As of July 1st, the, um, the museum for the Historical Society in Rye is open by appointment and that information can be found on our website, Rye New Hampshire Historical Society org. And you can find um, the phone number or the email in which to, obviously I just gave that to you, in which to contact if you were wanting to make an appointment and it is with mask and socially distance, etc. We um, will start reading a new book next week. So don't leave us, come back for 5 p.m. Sunday history happy hour as we continue to read and I will tempt you and tell you that the book is about rye and the seashore. So another local and we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for joining us. We will see you in the near future. Have a great afternoon. Enjoy summertime as it is wherever you are. Stay healthy, stay well, keep six feet, wash your hands. Thanks. See you later. Bye.